Good morning. My name is Brian Riskus. Uh, I'm the president and design engineer for RMD Systems based out of San Luis Obispo, California. And this morning, I'm going to be talking with you about uh, the use of small UAS for aero application of chemicals for invasive plant management. So a little bit of uh, company background. RMD is an engineering company. We specialize in the design and construction of electromechanical systems. Uh, we've, we were started in 2013. We currently have three employees. We have a full suite of in-house design software uh, and analysis tools. We have in-house uh, fabrication and test facilities. Our main business is a contract design and manufacture of electromechanical systems for aerospace. So some of our past projects, um, camera stabilization platforms, uh, big hydraulic driven robot arms, control actuator systems for guided missiles, small satellite deployment mechanisms, fairings for launch vehicles, robotic pipeline inspection equipment. Um, kind of just a, a little bit of the background of, of what we do. So you might be wondering, how does an aerospace engineering company get into invasive plant management using UAPs? Uh, and the answer to that is with a contract to design and build a sprayer system for a small UAV that would dispense pheromones in a vineyard. So in 2014, we were contracted to build a sprayer tank system that could fit on a small UAV that would dispense uh, a pheromone-based pesticide for mealybug control. Um, this pheromone-based pesticide that the customer was interested in using uh, was very concentrated, almost like a toothpaste. And so it was very, very difficult to pump through a traditional pump system. Um, and also because it was so concentrated, um, a very small amount will cover a large acreage. So in this case, um, the effective um, coverage is about 0.9 ounces uh, per acre. I guess that was the effective rate. So one gallon on a UAV could cover approximately 80 acres. So that was an attractive proposition to the customer. Um, the pheromone pesticide itself uh, was a mating disruption um, pheromone. So we would spray um, basically female pheromones on the top of the vines um, and the male mealybugs would then be attracted to that pheromone and be unable to locate the females and thus it would break the mating cycle and reduce the mealybug population in the vineyard without necessarily spraying um, broad spectrum pesticides. So we built um, a custom tank uh, that was a pressure vessel that um, allowed us to dispense the, the thick toothpaste-like pheromone pesticide. Um, metallic pressure vessel, um, custom design built by us, and carried a, a small onboard gas bottle um, to essentially compensate for the loss of product in the tank as we were spraying. Uh, basically, what this meant is that we were dispensing the same amount of product regardless of the level in the tank. Um, we built just a one gallon tank, um, approximately 15 pound flight weight, uh, 200 PSI max operating pressure. Um, it's controlled by a solenoid valve that's driven by the flight controller on the UAV. So we can turn the tank on and off uh, remotely during flight. Uh, the tank is filled and drained with a sump system, a closed loop sump system. So we don't necessarily have to expose the operator to the pesticides and that sort of thing. So the project was a technical success. Um, but when the vineyard talked to the pesticide manufacturer, they found out that the pheromones could be diluted 10,000 to 1 by volume and still maintain their, their effectiveness. Um, what this meant is that now they could add the pheromones to their tractor mixes when they were driving through the fields, spraying fertilizer and that sort of thing uh, without any loss in effectiveness. And so although uh, our trials that we conducted were a technical success, uh, the UAV did work, the sprayer tank worked, the pheromones worked well. Um, basically the UAV, wasn't needed because they could get the same efficiency um, by essentially modify, modifying processes that were already in place. So 
although it was good for the customer, they got to use their pheromone based pesticide. Uh, not so good for us because they wouldn't need a pheromone spraying drum. So we had the tank system, we had the UAV, um, and we decided that, you know, hey, there's probably other uses for this type of equipment. Uh, so we did some market research and we connected with uh, the Land Conservancy here in um, San Luis Obispo, California, where we're located, and um, did some demonstrations of the system of spot spraying and flying the UAV around. Um, and basically, the, the system was very, very well received. Um, people immediately saw the potential applications um, and were very, very excited about the technology. Um, so what we did for the inv invasive plant uh, management is uh, rather than fly with a boom system like we flew on the pheromone based uh, pesticide that had small mister nozzles, we actually changed the nozzle to a pencil nozzle and had it directly under the UAV. Um, and the multi rotor airframe really um, is quite useful for this type of spraying um, basically because the nozzle is located relatively in the center of the vehicle and the rotor wash is radially symmetric around the center axis of the vehicle um, the rotor wash doesn't disturb the the spray directly under the vehicle um, and the rotor wash actually acts as uh, a shield if you will um, to prevent the drift um, from the the pencil nozzle so what we were able to find is that we have a really nice uh, tight cohesive stream of liquid that exits the tank on directly under the vehicle um, and because the vehicles are very very stable um, it provides us a very accurate platform on which to target um, deliberate spot sprays on specific plants or areas or you know where wherever the the liquid product needs to be applied. Um, we have very, very tight control of that. And the drift is really minimal. So um, based off some of these demonstrations that we had uh, with the management companies, with government agencies, with vineyards, um, we decided to build a platform, a UAV platform that was optimized for industrial uses. Uh, a lot of the feedback that we got from the off-the-shelf vehicle and our tank system um, the criticism was detected, directed mainly at the vehicle. Uh, it didn't fly long enough. It didn't carry a heavy enough payload. It was too fragile. There was wires that were exposed. It wasn't waterproof. How do you clean it, you know, if it gets dirty, things like that. Um, and so we realized that we are in a unique, um, a unique spot in that we design and build these types of systems um, for a living. And so we were uniquely positioned to where we have the tank. Uh, we have a, a customer base that's interested in using the tank, but they also desire a more rugged UAV. And so we went ahead and uh, applied our talents to making a UAV that was optimized for industrial uses, agriculture, basic plant management. So this is our flagship product, um, Vector R30. Um, basically, it's designed to have a very, very large payload capacity and a very long flight time when compared to just about any of the drones on the market. So as an example, um, with a 20-pound payload, we're seeing between 25 and 28 minutes of flight time, um, depending on the weather, you know, wind, um, high temperatures, things like that will reduce the, the flight time slightly. Um, it's uh, an octo rotor, so if you lose a motor, a propeller, or a speed control, you don't crash, you can still land it safely. Um, waterproof, you can hose it down uh, when you're done with it. Uh, have removable arms for transport and storage. Um, if we stay under FAA Part 107, uh, which limits UAVs to 55 pounds, we can fly with a 20 pound payload. Uh, if you can get a waiver uh, under the Section 333, or uh, maybe some other waiver that I'm not aware of, uh, you could potentially fly this vehicle with payloads as heavy as 40 pounds. Um, you can fly a variety of payloads, not just spare systems. You can fly, uh, we've flown camera gimbal systems, we've flown thermal cameras. Um, this machine is more capable of flying a LiDAR head. Um, you could fly multiple sensors at the same time. 
um, for aerial surveying, things like that. Um, so a real flexible platform. Uh, we can carry a lot of weight for a long time. Uh, again, just some more close-up shots of it. Um, again, the picture in the upper left is during our, our, our trials originally. Um, and that's, we were doing all of our testing with a 20 pound, uh, dummy weight. And again, uh, with that 20 pound dummy weight, see flight times between 25 and 28 minutes. So here's an example of an application that we use. Um, this was a lettuce customer, um, that has a weed problem around their irrigation valves. So during the growing season, when the lettuce is, uh, about ready to be harvested, uh, you can't walk in the lettuce field because you will kill some of the lettuce and lose the product um, to go spray these weeds that grow up around these irrigation valves. Um, and if you were to drive a tractor out there, well, you kill a lot more of the lettuce and the tractor doesn't have implements that can actually reach and kill the weeds around the valve. So typically what the customer has been doing is just let the weeds grow all season. And then once all the lettuce is harvested, then go out and manually spray the weeds. Um, however, the weeds get quite big and they can contaminate the rest of the field. So uh, in this case, the UA UAV is uh, ideal for this application. So you can see in the upper left hand corner, we have a picture. This is um, actually, a, a, I believe, a, a KMZ file that is generated from the vehicle. Uh, you can see we know the location, the GPS location of the valves. We program a flight path to take off fly uh, to the first valve in the field, descend, uh, fly what we call a lawnmower pattern, so essentially a zigzag pattern, uh, raise up to a ferry altitude, fly over to the second valve, drop down to the spraying altitude, which in this case uh, is between 8 and 10 feet above the ground, um, fly another lawnmower pattern, then raise up to the ferry altitude, uh, which we had in this case set at 50 feet. Um, just want to, don't want to fly it too close to the ground. If you can avoid it, there's less risk that way. And then the vehicle would come back and land back where it started. So uh, flight parameters for this, this, uh, this job, uh, we're spraying at 10 feet above ground level. We're spraying at two and a half miles an hour to, to limit the drift and get good coverage. Um, this flight that you see here took about 10 minutes. Uh, we had 60% battery remaining. We flew uh, about a half a mile and we sprayed two valves in one, in one shot. Um, if we used slightly less um, herbicide, we could potentially do more valves because we certainly have the, the battery and the flight time to do it. Um, it should be noted, this flight was done uh, completely autonomous with the exception of the takeoff. Um, we can do automated takeoff as well. It's just we like to do manual takeoff um, to give it a quick flight control check to make sure that everything's working on the system before we let it go and do its thing. So we have data, a lot of data that gets obtained from the drone during its flight. Um, it generates KMZ files that we can plot in Google Earth, and it also uh, generates what are called data flash logs. So the data flash logs basically tell the health of the vehicle, if you want to think of it that. Uh, everything from the current consumption of the batteries, the voltage of the batteries, uh, the angle that the vehicle is leaning in pitch, roll, and yaw, GPS location, number of GPS satellites, vibration in the vehicle. Um, they act as a black box, essentially. And so it's really a good feature for us to have um, so we can really monitor the health of the vehicle uh, each flight and see if anything changes. And it gives us an indication if there is something, you know, starting to go wrong with the vehicle. We don't find out when it falls out of the sky. Um, so the KMZ files that are generated from the flight path are also very, very useful. We can plot them in Google Earth and verify that the drone actually flew and sprayed where we wanted it to fly and spray. Um, so we can ground truth it, obviously, 
Um, and then we also have electronic copies of what the drone did that we can provide to the customer. So in this case, when we're spraying the lettuce field, we couldn't physically walk out into the field. And so the KMZ files were really, really helpful. Um, but we can give those to the customer and say, hey, this is where it was sprayed. And then uh, when he goes back after harvest, he can then look and, and ground truth it against our KMZ files. Um, so the GPS that we use on these vehicles um, typically sees between 18 and 22 satellites from several different constellations. Um, generally, the accuracy we see is between 0.5 and 0.6 meters, so roughly 20 inches, about half the size of the vehicle. Um, this type of GPS accuracy we found is acceptable for automated spraying of row crops and big patches of weeds. Um, you can plan your flight path uh, using a shape file or a KML file, um, which is what we did here. We actually did it with a shape file where we had a shape file of each plot around the valve. And then we simply used that shape file to generate our grid pattern with overlap, that sort of thing. Um, if you need to target a specific plant, um, like some customers that we're talking with about doing aerial sprays in very sensitive wildland areas, um, it would be better to use a small downward facing camera and a manual pilot. Um, and then that way you have ultimate control over where you are going to be applying your chemical. Um, and there, you don't have to worry about the, the accuracy of the GPS, you actually have a human in the loop with eyes on target making the decision, yes, we're going to dispense chemicals on this plant. So this is a, a potential application that we're working with here is we have um, Chubata grass that are on these rugged mountain slopes here in um, central California. What we're finding, even though we have the equipment, the equipment works, it's proven, um, to operate in these sensitive areas, um, we need approval uh, and paperwork from the FAA and other government agencies before we can fly the UAV. Um, basically, what the FAA wants to see is uh, the pilot to have a Part 137 um, crop dusters pilot license and a, a journeyman's applicator license for applying chemicals from an aircraft. Um, so basically what this means in layman's terms is that we need to partner with um, somebody who's already doing aerial applications from a helicopter or an airplane because they have all of the required certificates um, and paperwork to satisfy the FAA to do this. And so you may have different requirements in the states, in different states, but on the federal level, um, I believe that you will still need a Part 137 uh, pilot to at least be present on site while you are performing um, sprays from your vehicle. Um, so a little more detail about the, uh, the amount of spray drift and the camera system that we use. Um, you can see in the lower left picture, there's two spots, uh, wet spots on the dirt. Um, the spot that is closest to the top of the picture, that's a bit tighter spot, that was sprayed from 18 feet above ground level. Uh, while the spot that's slightly lower and in a larger area was sprayed from 60 feet above ground level. And both of those sprays were conducted uh, same flight, same day, same wind conditions. Um, wind conditions, as I recall, maybe two miles an hour, not much. Um, but you can see the, the stream of liquid stays pretty cohesive. Uh, middle picture, you can see um, the small camera. It's a HD camera, so we have good resolution with that. Uh, positioned on the side of the solenoid, uh, it lets us get a real good picture of um, what the stream looks like and where we're hitting. And then the last picture on the right is obviously just uh, a shot of the vehicle and some of the, the sprays that we did. So a uh, little overview on what it takes to operate uh, UAVs uh, commercially. So FAA uh, 14 CFR Part 107 outlines the operating rules for commercial small UAS. Um, the UAV must weigh less than 55 pounds at takeoff. You are not allowed to fly at any higher than 400 feet above ground level. You're not allowed to fly it over people. No flights over 100 miles an hour. You can only fly the UAV during the day. 
uh, unless you're equipped with navigation lighting, which we have nav lights uh, on our vehicles. Uh, with the lighting, you can be operated 30 minutes before sunrise and 30 minutes after sunset, uh, civil twilight. Um, the UAV must always be operated within the line of sight of the pilot of command. Um, the FAA does not mandate any record keeping or flight logs. However, it is really a good idea to keep a flight log. That's where the data flash logs come in handy is that you'll have, um, you have an electronic copy that's generated automatically of what the vehicle was doing during flight and where you flew with the uh, KMZ files. Um, and it's really, really helpful in, in keeping logs. You know, with our vehicles, we have electronic copies of all of our data flash logs and the KMZs. So we know where we flew, what we flew, and exactly what was done to the vehicle. Um, should you have a crash and the FAA becomes involved, if you can present that information to them, um, they're going to want to see that. They're going to want to see that you have diligent record keeping um, and that you've maintained your system. Because all uh, UAVs are machines. They do require periodic maintenance um, to keep them operating safely. Uh, generally, the, multi, the electric multi-rotor UAVs, there's not a whole lot of maintenance you have to perform on them, but you just need to make sure that the propellers, are they're not chipped, they're not cracked, they're not bent. You want to make sure that the motor bearings turn smoothly, that they, there's no grinding or, or slop in them. Uh, and generally, you want to make sure that your batteries are in good condition. So monitoring the voltage um, during the charging cycle is the best way to do that. So... If you're thinking about adding uh, drones or UAVs to your your business or, or your, your daily activities, um, an easy way to think about it is it, what's called the three Ds, which is dirty, dull, or dangerous. And so if you have um, basically areas that you need to access that are dangerous, like the cliffs that we talked about earlier um, for climbers um, to go spray plants on a hillside, well, that's dangerous for personnel. So UAV is very attractive to reduce the risk to personnel there. Um, if you have repetitive tasks, dull, right, like spraying the valves of the lettuce field, um, where we can program one flight path and this machine can fly the same path weekly, daily, however, however often the farmer wants to, to fly these paths. Um, and really the operator just all he has to do is load the tank and load the batteries and let the vehicle fly that path, the same path, uh, every time we fly it. And then, um, you know, the last thing is, uh, again, dirty. If, you know, if you don't want your personnel walking through the brush with a backpack sprayer, spilling chemicals on themselves, uh, a UAV is a good way to, to remove persons from the loop, so to speak. Um, so in closing, um, RMD, we're an OEM for heavy lift uh, spraying drones, industrial drones. Uh, we provide sales, maintenance repair, overhaul, spare parts, after sales support and training for all the systems that we sell. Um, if you're located in California, we also uh, perform services with our own in-house equipment. Uh, we'd love to perform services elsewhere in the country, but right now being three people, it's a little difficult for us. Um, that being said, you know, if you have operators that are near you and they want to purchase one of our systems, we can certainly support them. So if anybody has any questions or comments, um, I can be reached uh, at my email, brian at rmd-systems.com. Um, or again, feel free, uh, give me a call back on my direct line, uh, 805-458-6844. I'm always happy to discuss any applications you may have. Um, or just uh, give general background information. So, again, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for having me. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to this presentation. And, again, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. All right. Thank you.